My name is Brandon Abbott. And I'm Scott Winkler. Our mentor is Jin Jing Zhao, and our advisors are Dr. Scott Hewson and Dr. Chris Kitchens. Um, and today we are presenting the development of perm selective composite membranes for carbon dioxide sequestration. Um, a major environmental issue faced by industrialized countries concerns atmospheric carbon dioxide emissions. The technology is currently used to help separate and sequester this greenhouse gas. Utilize energy intensive technologies typically resulting from a phase change, such as the case for the traditional amine absorption process. Due to projected increased energy demands, as well as rises in costs associated with energy usage, there's a need for simplistic and less energy intensive technology for performing these gas separations. Membranes have this potential and currently exhibit great promise. Specific to this research, our group wanted to develop a methodology for fabricating highly reproducible composite membranes for carbon dioxide separation. Moreover, we wanted to measure the carbon dioxide permeance and ideal CO2 over N2 selectivities as a function of both pressure and time for each of the following cases. Uncoated polyacrylonitrile and polyether sulfone membranes, support membranes coated with a fluorinated polymer gutter, gutter layer, and support membranes coated consecutively with a gutter layer and a carbon dioxide selective layer um, of perfluor perfluorocyclobutyl or PFCB polymer, which is detailed in figure two. Um, our experimental methods consisted of basically washing bare membranes in a methanol bath followed by a short dry period. Um, and after this, they were followed by a dip coating process, which was um, dip coated into a fluorinated polymer, which acted as our gutter layer, and then it was vacuum dried. Um, we treated the gutter layer with a plasma treatment to increase surface energy um, and water soaked prior to adding the CO2 selected PFCB layer. A permeance testing apparatus shown in figure three was then utilized to determine the permeance by inducing various pressures um, across the membrane and then recording the flux. So this is the results for the uncoated PES or polyether sulfone membrane. So this is the membrane after we had washed it in the methanol bath and we dried it and we tested the permeance, the CO2 permeance and the nitrogen permeance. In this graph, you can see the CO2 permeance against the pressure difference and the selectivity is what we would expect for a Newton diffusion mechanism. The pore size was calculated using the Newton diffusion equation and the uh, viscous flow equation. And uh, the selectivity is what we would expect. So this is the coated and untreated polyether sulfone 20 membrane. So this is after we have applied the fluorinated polymer gutter layer. And as you can see, our consistency is quite good. We were able to produce a uh, membrane with a selectivity of five and a half, which is better than the bulk value we see in literature, which is five, and which indicates that this is a mostly defect-free membrane. The standard deviation is a thousand, which is which is high, but I, I think that having a selectivity of 5.5 .5 is more than compensates for this. The, as you can see, there's an overall selectivity and there's an intrinsic selectivity. So the overall selectivity is the selectivity that we see through the entire composite membrane. But there is a different selectivity through the uh, fluorinated polymer. And we can use the resistance equation, which is shown below in the blue box, which says that one over the permeance of the entire composite membrane is equal to one over the permeance of the gutter layer and then plus one over the permeance of the bare membrane. This is why the data for the permeance of the bare membrane is important. And this is, uh, this is good. Um, followed by the dip coating process, uh, we needed to modify the surface to enhance the wettability or the surface energy um, of our gutter layer prior to dip coating it into the PFCB um, CO2 selective polymer. Um, plasma treatment was utilized um, using argon gas to carry out this task. Um, we used the contact angle measurement to basically determine the effectiveness of this plasma treatment, as well as the case of plasma treatment followed by a 24 hour water soak period. Um, figure six shows these contact angles um, for both the, the 
composite membrane prior to modification, as well as the composite membrane with plasma treatment um, and the composite membrane with plasma treatment and water soak. As you can see, the, the contact angle decreased um, with further modification, um, suggesting a, an increase in surface energy, which is what we wanted. One small problem um, with this process, though, is the potential for etching away of the gutter layer, which would in turn lower our permeance and selectivity, which is shown in figure seven. And in fact, this is what happened, but it was so minimal that, um, that, that it was all right for our process. This is the aging effects of the plasma treated and washed composite me membrane. So after we have done surface modification on the polymer surface, but before we apply the selective layer, we can we, we tested the membrane performance uh, at 24 hours and at 134 hours. And we see that strangely the permeance is increasing. This is contrary to what we would expect from literature, but this is probably because the membrane was not fully dry after we had done the, the washing in the water for a day. So during the, the week that it, uh, it was sitting, uh, there was some water that was likely evaporating from the surface and reducing the density of the uh, membrane. This would increase the permeance but keep the selectivity the same, which is what we're seeing. So, so this is a likely case. This is data for the complete composite membrane that we have. And this is the composite membrane as you see in the figure in the beginning where we have the support membrane, we have the gutter layer, we have treated it and washed it, and then we've applied the selective layer. And the CO2 permeance and the overall selectivity that we're seeing through this membrane. Now, there is low selectivity for this composite membrane. We would expect the selectivity to be closer to 22, but we're just we're not seeing this. This is only uh, two membranes that we had time to test. So, um, in conclusion, um, from this process, we have basically learned that the fabrication process of basically making these membranes uh, and each procedural step has to be very consistent. If, if this is not done, then we see um, a wide fluctuation of, of performance testing, um, and this was shown in the graph previously with the high standard deviation. Um, as well, another important thing to note from this is the intrinsic perm selectivity values for both gutter layer and the CO2 selective PFCB layer can be modeled by the resistance in series equations. Um, and, and as mentioned before, our permeance values, which are relatively high compared to current literature, um, decrease with addition of each polymer. But as I said before, th these values are still um, are much higher than um, most of the current literature that is um, present. And as well as we see a, a very um, good selectivity. Um, our future work would be to study the plasticization effects of the CO2 selective PSCB layer um, and basically try and understand what is happening with the swelling and plasticization. Um, eventually, we would like to um, cross-link the polymer and be able to minimize this plasticization effect. And after we've basically minimized the plasticization effects by cross-linking the polymer, then we would like to um, basically try and industrialize this, um, um, this process by sending a mixed gas through the system and analyzing it using the GC or gas um, chromatography to um, analyze our mixed gas composition after um, filtering it through a membrane. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, we have some questions coming in. Uh, there was actually a question in reference to figure two. So if you could go back to that, I think it was slide four. Um, and I'll get those started again. If you have any questions, uh, if your chat window is not open, there's a green tab at the top of your screen. You can select chat and send those questions in. Uh, so first of all, on figure two, what do the orange blobs represent? And is that meant to represent a pore structure? Could you describe that uh, figure two a little bit? This is a example of an asymmetric membrane. So the um, these are just the orange blobs are just polymer chains in the 
membrane, and uh, it's for the pore size of this bare membrane. The gutter layer and the PFCB layer are assumed to be uh, defect free and there are no pores like we see in the bare membrane. And um, you may have mentioned this already, but there was another question probably about this figure. Of what are the approximate thicknesses of the various layers? Um, currently, we have not really been able to estimate um, the film thickness. We have done a few simple um, um, pr procedural like experiments to try and determine the mass that we're depositing onto our bare membrane, um, both the gutter layer and the selective layer. But currently, we've not really been able to um, calculate the, the thickness of these films. Um, we hope to do that using um, thin films on silicon wafers and, and, and potentially being able to determine um, how much we're coating because um, it, it's very, um, very dependent of the thickness of the film. And in, in, re, in regards to the gutter layer, we're actually using a 0.3 weight percent solution of our fluorinated, um, fluorinated um, polymer. And uh, we have tested several concentrations. So we're basically trying to determine uh, the thickness using concentration. We think it might be on the order of 20 nanometers. Uh, great. Let's see, our next question comes from uh, Scott. Uh, what is the intrinsic selectivity of the P, uh, PFCB layer using the resistance equation? We have not had time to calculate that yet, but by the final presentation next week, that will be there will be a table for that intrinsic value. Okay, thanks. And the next question uh, from Chris. Uh, do you see evidence of plastication on the gutter layer? We did not see evidence of plasticization at the pressures we were using. We only went up to a delta P of 28 PSI. And for what we were doing, we would bring it up to the 28 PSI difference, and then we would bring it back down, and we did not see any evidence of plasticization. We are going to try in the future for higher pressure uh, permeance testing, and we will see plasticization then. Um, and also, in addition uh, to what Scott said, our uh, fluorinated um, polymer is um, highly resistant to plasticization, and um, that's one of the primary reasons for using it um, in, in testing our um, membranes. We actually would go back and retest um, the minimal pressure to actually to, to try and see if there was a plasticization effect. And, and as Scott mentioned, we have not um, really been able to see that at the pressures that we were working with. Uh, thank you. A couple more questions from Heather. Uh, Two-part question. What was the reason that plasma treatment of the gutter layer was needed? Is it a matter of poor adhesion or poor performance without the treatment? The plasma treatment creates uh, radicals and uh, peroxides on the surface, which increases wettability on the membrane surface. Additionally, it creates some cross-linking on the surface, which is why also the aging effects on the treated membrane are so minimal, because there's some cross-linking that's happening. The surface modification with the plasma treatment is necessary for applying the selective layer. And we see that after we modify the surface that the, uh, the contact angle is decreasing. And this is necessary for putting on the selective layer. It means that the surface energy is higher. Uh, thank you. And uh, another question from Xinjiang. Do you have any ideas to decrease the defects on the DFCD layer? So let's go over to this right here. This is the complete composite membrane, and we see that the selectivity is lower. So we can likely increase the concentration of the selective layer polymer that we're using, because if the interaction between the PFCB polymer and the gutter layer polymer is not very high, we're going to see some de-wetting on the surface. So the 
the PFCB uh, polymer is going to congregate and it's going to leave some pinhole defects. Also, we can improve our dip coating method and we're working on getting a, a, an improved method for consistently dip coating because this is another big problem we're having. Uh, in fact, we had another question that came in for Brandon. Uh, what temperatures can these layers withstand uh, glass transition temperature or melting temperature, especially when you may use the membrane with a hot flue ga gas? Um, I, I am not necessarily familiar with uh, the temperatures for both of the polymers, but I do know in the case for the PAN, um, the polyacrylic nitrile membrane, that it is actually um, only able to withstand temperatures of around 50 degrees Celsius. So basically when we are um, washing uh, and drying uh, the bare membrane to remove the filler, we cannot exceed uh, temperatures of this amount, other, otherwise we would damage the membrane. And um, as mentioned before, um, every little detail that we do to these membranes is is is, is scrutinized. So we have to, to try and be as consistent as possible and try and be as defect free as possible. So um, right now we, we pretty much just uh, make sure that the temperatures do not go above uh, 50 degrees um, C. Uh, great, and uh, there was just one last comment uh, for Scott from Hans, Lance, and Lisa. Good job. Uh, I guess that's the Winkler family is here in Mass today. Um, so that's the end of uh, this session. Thank you very much for attending our second session. We have three more.